Hello, you cool cats. Welcome back to the program. My name is Dr. Dan. I'm a pharmacist turned weight management specialist. And today we're talking about part two. And in particular, we're going to dive into the second portion of the primal brain. Now, before we kick things off, as always, don't forget to hit the subscribe button down below so that you don't miss another episode that comes out, particularly with this series where I'm talking about the brain and obesity. And check me out on my other channels at the official Dr. Dan, where I post content every single day so you can stay up to date on the most relevant information and the most interesting facts that I might be putting out for the day. All right, so a quick recap. In part one, we talked about the biological part of the primal brain. And the reason why I call it the biological part of the brain is because it's, it's running based on biology. It is taking information from our environment and getting us to engage and do behaviors that are going to keep us in balance and feeling well. So if you're cold, it's going to tell you to put on a coat. If you're hungry, it's going to tell you to go and eat. And this is all in an effort to keep us alive for the next five minutes. You can kind of think of our bodies kind of like a crying baby is really needy and the poor brain is a strung out mother that is just trying to shove a bottle in the baby's face or do whatever she needs to do so that she can ultimately go back to sleep. And all of this makes sense, right? If you're hungry, you need to go eat. If you're cold, you need a jacket. If you need to poop, you go poop. All of these things need to happen in order to keep us alive. It's all logical and is part of evolution. Well, are you ready for the irrational and the illogical part of our brain? Well, in this part, we're going to talk about the emotional part of the primal brain, which certainly serves a purpose. It keeps us alive. It is very important. However, it can lead us to being stressed out about things. It really is a root of many of our problems and causes us to do some really stupid things at times. Some people refer to this part of our brain as the thinking mind. It's always working in the background and it's, it's thinking. It has a number of thoughts. So it's thinking about, oh, did I turn the iron off at home? You know, my boss is a dink and what am I gonna have for lunch today? However, the thoughts that our thinking mind often has has to deal with our emotions. So generally this part of our brain has thoughts and is reviewing past events, such as the time you accidentally called your grade school teacher mom, or maybe that time that you embarrassed yourself in front of that pretty girl or pretty boy, or how you're obsessing and analyzing every single word, action, and behavior that the person that you like does in order to try and figure out if they like you as well. Quick pro tip, the more you're analyzing it, the more they probably don't like you. And in the worst case scenario, you'll continue to ruminate and obsess and think about how you felt in a given situation. And your brain is really good at not only getting you to think about these things, but also to feel those feelings once again. And it seems that it largely focuses on the negative emotions versus maybe looking at the positive emotions. So why might that be? Well, you see, our primal brain has what is called a negativity bias. As per Wikipedia, a negativity bias is where we have, say, two emotions, events, thoughts, social interactions, what have you. They are of equal intensity, but one is positive and one is negative. And with a negativity bias, the one that is negative in nature is going to have a greater effect on one's psychological state. And doesn't that sound like a miserable way to live? But the truth of the matter is, is that negativity bias has ultimately been what has helped humans to evolve and survive over the last 30,000 years. You see, 30,000 years ago, something that was negative in nature generally meant no bueno. Eating a mystery berry and developing explosive diarrhea? No bueno. Trying to pet a saber-toothed tiger? No bueno. And studies have actually shown that if people are showing a photo with a group of people in it, and some of those people are purposely showing an angry expression, we are able to pick out the angry expressive people more quickly. And that is because an angry face could mean a potential danger or harm to us. Like, you know, the look that your mother would give you when you were being a little shit? Yeah, I bet you smartened up real quick because you saw that face and you knew that impending danger was coming your way. So as you can see, having this negativity bias was essential for our survival over the last 30,000 years. If we were positive about everything, well, we'd go and get ourselves hurt and do even more stupid things than what we already do. Now, obviously, we live in a modern society where the chances of dying and getting hurt are considerably lower on a day-to-day -day basis. So why do we still have this stupid part of our brain? Well, if you remember from part one, our primal brain really is a crotchety old man that is set in their ways and refuses to change. As well, things of both a positive and negative nature still do play a role in our day-to-day -day lives, in particular when it comes to our emotions. You see, emotions give us insights into both good and bad things that are currently ongoing and happening in our lives. The problem arises when we let our emotions run the entire show. 
And an adorable human fallacy is that people think they can control their thoughts and emotions just through sheer willpower. Sorry to say, but that's definitely not the case. And in fact, the more that you try to suppress or ignore your emotions and feelings, the more intense they become. So let's do a little thought experiment. You just got off work, it was a stressful day, and you're driving on your way home and you realize, hey, I need to stop and get groceries in order to make dinner tonight. Suddenly, you're down the candy aisle looking at your favorite chocolate bar and you start thinking, oh, that would be really delicious. I just had a stressful day. I deserve to have this, etc., etc. The thoughts and emotions start to go on and you start really thinking about just how amazing that chocolate bar would be, even though you're not even hungry. But you're trying to lose weight, so you decide to restrain and hold back on getting the chocolate bar and you end up walking away, go and check out and get on your way. However, the thought of that chocolate bar doesn't go away. So you start trying to ignore the thoughts and you even start distracting yourself, anything to get that chocolate bar off your mind. But suddenly the urge to eat that chocolate bar becomes overwhelming. Like, my God, it would be amazing to have that chocolate bar right now. Next thing you know, you are back at the grocery store and instead of buying just the one you might have bought earlier, you're buying three of those chocolate bars. And next thing you know, you're back out in your car and you've already eaten all three chocolate bars and it's like all of that you didn't even realize was happening. And like most people who have just binged on three chocolate bars, you're probably feeling a little bit physically ill. And your thoughts have now switched from how delicious the chocolate bar is to you're a failure, you're a loser, you are never going to be able to lose weight at this rate. And down the rabbit hole we then go. And unfortunately, every self-affirmation and positive psychological hack is not going to help you to stop that spiral of negative thoughts and emotions. Trust me, I know. Damn emotional brain. So that's fantastic, Dr. Dan. How the hell do I control my emotions then? The thing is, you don't. Thoughts and emotions are always going to happen. You see, our goal is to observe them, to possibly influence them, and ultimately try to act despite of them. Now, this is where our modern brain comes into play. And Mark Manson, the author of The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck, refers to our modern brain as the observing mind. And more on that in part three. But I love the analogy that Mark Manson uses for the thinking mind and the observing mind. And I wanna share it with you here. And you can imagine the thinking mind as being the driver of the car of your life. That's right, you have the old man from the movie Up that is currently at the wheel of your life. And your modern brain or observing mind is riding shotgun. And the observing mind is attempting to give directions to the old man, but you see, the old man can barely hear, can barely see, and to be quite frank, really doesn't give a single fuck about where you want to go. And he is going to go wherever he wants to go. And so what could possibly go wrong, right? And I'm gonna say, bring on the haters because I'm gonna leave you on a cliffhanger and we're gonna talk about in part three, how we can start to potentially influence that old man. And as I'm finishing up here, I'm realizing that this might be a five-parter, maybe a six or seven-parter, really haven't decided yet, but more and more ideas just come to me and you know, my fantastic brain is just gonna do what it's gonna do. But it'll all be totally worth it, I promise you that. So stay tuned, and again, don't forget to hit the subscribe button down below so that you don't miss another episode, and particularly of this series, you get every single episode. Check me out on my other channels, at the official Dr. Dan, where I post content every single day. And of course, check out my website, healthcareevolve.ca. And for now, everybody, that is it. And always remember that small tweaks lead to massive peaks.